All right, okay, all right, all right, okay. It is your boy BQ. Welcome back to the Negative BQ YouTube channel, the most negative channel on the planet. Obviously, I'm not going to be reviewing an episode of Impact this week uh, due to the hurricane and all the changes being made to the taping schedule. They aired Best of Bound for Glory. Uh, your boy is not going to watch that. Much respect to you guys who did watch it. You got to be a, a hell of a fan to sit there and be like, hey, I'm just going to watch the Best of Bound for Glory. But if you did, more power to you. I personally don't have interest in that um i mean god for years i was podcasting and begging them to get away from the past and to start focusing on the present and the future you know and and finally finally we're kind of doing that but in that same breath you're, you're not going to see me sit down and watch the best of bfg <laughs> uh, i'm sure there was some very good stuff on there um my my personal best of bound for glory matches probably aren't what the average fan likes or what the company likes. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, just no, no interest in it. So I decided to do a mailbag episode this week to replace it, but I wanted to do something a little bit different as well. Um, my guy Io at, in the uh, Impact Lounge engagement group on Facebook, he had posted some TNA stats, some interesting stats from uh, a Twitter account called WrestleStats. Just just some very interesting t statistics regarding the TNA Impact TV show uh, and who was, you know, featured the most, basically, um, as far as wins and losses and just how many times we've seen him wrestle. And there was other stats like bell to bell and all that that I gave, a sh you know, three shits about. But I was good. I wanted to get into some of these with you guys before I got to the questions. So the mailbag is going to be a little shorter. It is my birthday weekend. My mom was in town. My aunt's in town. They're not was. They they, they both are still in town. So my, my mom and my aunt, they do leave today. But it's my birthday weekend. And I'm not, uh, you know, I, I told the group, send me questions. But I'm not doing insider shit. Don't, don't send me something that I've, that I've got to go dig into and message someone and all that shit. I was like, I, I got shit going on this weekend, so it's going to be a very simple mailbag. But I want to get into these TNA year-to-date stats. So we're talking January first through October third. That was what. That's where the the stats are. And since we didn't get an episode of October third, we know that these are just kind of consistent at this point. Um, the first one I'm going to get into here is number of TV matches. So keep in mind when I go through these numbers that I'm not talking about TNA plus I'm not talking about pay-per-views and I had to disconnect myself from that thinking as I was going over some of these statistics because I was like this isn't correct and I keep I had to keep reminding myself no this is for the TV show the TV show so you know January 1st up until now and uh let's get into this one time for your mind so I'm going to be using my sound bites the majority are going to be in this uh, first group here. So uh, number of TV matches. So this was uh, how many, just how many wrestled, how many times I wrestled on TV this year. So I was actually pretty surprised to see uh, number one was Chris Bay. I'm terribly sorry. I don't know why I can't stop saying black, the word black. I'm terribly sorry. I don't know why I can't stop saying. He actually, um, didn't mean to black. play that twice. The Sorry. Word black. Oh, it's still playing. Um, Eddie Edwards was actually tied with him. So Chris Bay had 18 matches this year, and Eddie Edwards tied with him with 18 matches this year. So All right, far. son, I'm going to need those two hams back. I don't have any hams. Lift up your shirt, son. And what I'm going to do is top five for all these, and then a couple honorable mentions. Um, tied for number two, Ace Austin. Is this your card? Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's it's not, is it? No. Uh... And cheese ball, Mike Bailey. Jeez. Yeah. Didn't we lock you in a dumpster one time? I got out. So no, no big surprises there. Uh, Chris Bay, Eddie Edwards, Azos, and Mike Bailey. The next one. Well, so the next one is a tie. 
Uh, but the and this is 14 matches this year. We had Jordan Grace, uh, Kushida, Zachary Wentz. In one word, would I use dope? Nope. So no, again, no huge surprises there. Kushida is break glass in case of emergency. Hey, we need someone to pretend they might win a match, but they're gonna fucking lose. That's always how it works. Um, Zachary Wentz, I feel like he got all these matches in in the last like three weeks or so. And then Jordan Grace, obviously, she wrestles what feels like every episode. She's done a million open challenges. But the one that's really crazy to me that ties, this is 14 matches. The other person that tied with them, I would have never guessed this in a million years, but it's Naked Jake, Jake something. Do you mind if I slip into something more comfortable? I would have, I just would have never guessed that. I don't feel like I am seeing him as a regular wrestling on my TV, the naked man. So, um, yeah, number of TV matches. Next one is wins, wins on television. Number one is Jordan Grace. That is not a shocker. Jordan Grace does not lose. She's not going to lose. I've said this about a few other wrestlers. She is not going to lose until she leaves the company. Promise you, no tag team match, no nothing. She's going to eventually drop the title, probably to Masha. Uh, Tom Hannafin will ensure that uh, they have their contractually obligated rematch. Oh. And then Masha will probably win there as well. And then, you know, at that point, Jordan Grace will probably be gone. But that is a formula they use with Mustafa Ali, with Trinity. And I pointed it out every time with those guys. I said they're not going to lose until they leave. Now, granted, we're talking part-timers and Jordan Grace is a full-timer, but still, Jordan Grace will not lose. So she has 10 wins on TV. Number two, which was really interesting, Ash by Elegance with nine. She only has one less win on TV than Jordan Grace, but she hasn't wrestled as many matches on TV as Jordan Grace. So I don't think Ash has, I think she's only lost once on TV. I think she's like nine for 10. I think she lost that match by elegance and that was it i don't i don't think uh like we know that ash is going to lose on pay-per-view that's that's what it is but but she has won i got a, a sound bite coming for her pretty soon as well number two i mean not number two but number three with eight wins chris bay now i said at the top of the show chris bay has wrestled the most matches with 18 he's won eight of them so there's like less than 50 50 booking with this dude it's like 45 55 uh, Joe Hendry, he ties. This is these are all tied here with eight. So with Chris Bay, it's Joe Hendry, um, Josh Alexander. Who else? Who else? Nick Nemeth and Zachary Wentz. So, um, and then Ace Austin is honorable mention here. He's he's seven seven wins out of fifteen matches. So he's also under fifty fifty booking. So uh, we throw in here. You know, Chris Bay and, and Ace Austin, these are like two time tag team champions this year, and they're just 50 50. I mean, again, not even 50 50. They have, they've lost more than they've won, but they're like two time tag team champions. Uh, Eddie Edwards is not even on here because he's number one for a number of losses 11, 11 losses. So, what do we say? He's wrestled 18 matches, he has lost 11 of them. Again, two time. Tag team champions. That doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. He is another utility guy. Break glass in case of emergency. Let's go out and have a good match and then freaking lose. Now, I have praised the booking of the system because there's been times where they've been booked extremely strong. I've used the, the comparisons of OVE, of... Uh, what was that group? Honor No More, where it's like we have these stables, but they just take losses. You know what I'm saying? And the system has been better, but the system is still 50 50 booking. It's just a different type of like booking overall. They'll go on win streaks. They'll win like the system as a as a whole will win three or four matches, and then they'll like lose three or four matches. And, and it's usually Eddie Edwards and, and Brian Myers on the losing end of those. But it's crazy because you're talking two-time tag team champions. They've spent a lot of the year being the tag team champions, but they were still taking losses. They took a loss fucking two weeks ago on the show as the as the champions. 
So the next in number of losses is Chris Bay. No shocker there. I've already talked about that. Cody Diener, nine, which is funny because he's not even sniffing these other numbers as, as number of TV matches, but he loses. If you if you're gonna if you see Cody Diener, who is like not over, not even a little bit. If you see Cody Diener on screen, he is going to lose. Uh, Kushida with nine losses. I want to find a soundbite for Kushida. Big big free agent signing. I got to find Tony Khan saying, you know, he's talking about Mercedes Monet. You know, biggest free agent signing in the history of pro wrestling. That, that's what I need to find for um, Kushida. Oh, what a kick out! And then um, Ace Austin with eight. Uh, the Naked Man. Jake something with eight. And then honorable mention, Zaya Brookside. No fucking shocker there. She loses all the time. And then Mike Bailey. That one was a shocker to me. I don't feel like Mike Bailey ever loses. Uh, you know, he, he'll lose his, like, every once in a while, the surprise roll-up, distraction finish. He never loses, loses. Shouldn't win the match. It's always fuckery. Always. But I don't feel like he's lost 17, seven times on TV this year. Because he's not even in the top five of number of TV matches. So that's like a very weird stat to me. Because I feel like every time we see him on TV, he wins. So And, and he's, again, two-time X Division champion this year. But seven losses on TV. So we like, we like to beat our, our uh, champions in this company. I had to laugh um, at this one. Because this is it's still number of losses. But... With one loss, one televised loss in 2024, PCO. Smells like Bigfoot's dick. And then um, Josh Alexander's on there as well. One TV loss. So he's he has lost. Uh, he loses on pay-per-view also. Just like Ash by Elegance, he loses on pay-per-view. But on TV, he's uh, pretty unbeatable. So I didn't use my, my Zaya Brookside soundbite because i had to use it here the matches we've seen the most in 2024 as four times we have seen this match ash by elegance versus queen of the rubber match <laughs> zaya brookside number two that we've seen three times this year tasha steals got a badass over here Versus Queen of the Rubber Match. <laughs> Zaya Brookside. So that's where Zaya Brookside got her nickname with me because her first six matches in TNA were against two different people. So she had a best of three series with uh, Tasha Steeles. And then after that, she had a best of three series with Ash by Elegance. So she is um, forever Queen of the Rubber <laughs> Match. <laughs> A match that we saw twice this year was ABC versus the Grizzled Young Vets. AJ Francis versus the Convenient Store Machine Rhino. I forgot AJ Francis gets a soundbite because uh, the way I've explained it before that now Rich Swan is not in the group, or I guess he's in the group, he's not on TV. Now that uh, it is Casey Navarro, they went from first class to economy class. But I am telling you. back there is not real but we've seen aj francis versus rhino twice this year why the fuck did we see it once uh i know one was like a street fight which might <laughs> one of my favorite matches right there i'm here to tell you right now we don't care let me tell, right, let me tell you <laughs> we don't care awful match it was to set up uh aj francis versus pco at the pay-per-view um, awful match, awful match, but I can't believe we actually got it twice. We got the system versus the Hardys twice. Those were really good. Uh, the Hardys won one match and then the other one, I think was, they won the other one too, but it was like by disqualification. So the system is not going to beat the Hardys at any point with the Hardys and TNA. Trust me. Cause the Hardys are probably going to win the titles of bound for glory. I would imagine it's a three way, but, uh, the system at no point will beat the Hardys. And then, um, at that point, they're going to have their contractually obligated rematch. Oh, and, and, uh, and the Hardys will beat him again. Another match we got twice. I don't 
know fucking why we had to sit through this, but it was uh, Danny Luna versus Jody Threat. Tell me right now that I'm just a job. Tell me to my face. You're just that- a job. I'm here to tell you right now. We don't care. Let me tell, right, let me tell you. <laughs> we don't care. They were doing the storyline where they were doing the uh, going back to basics and all that. And they were wrestling each other and all this crap. Uh, but yeah, we had to sit through that a couple times. And you're going to see the knockouts. We, we talk about this all the time. They're a small division. So they just continue to fucking wrestle each other. In that same vein, Giselle Shaw had two matches with Tasha Steeles. And that was ridiculous. They had a match on Explosion. And based off that result, they decided that on television the following week they were going to have a match with like three referees. The goof ref was there and, you know, Spencer and the female. I mean, I don't know what shit show that was. I don't know what, I mean, talk about just taking a match that meant absolutely nothing and then putting a unnecessary stipulation on it that the live audience had no clue why it was going on. Um, JDC. These are spirit fingers. And these are gold. He wrestled uh, Mike Santana twice. That's nasty. And then we also got twice Jody Threat versus Masha Slamovich. Meet Fran Stalinaskovich Delvinovinsky. And uh, I think Jody Threat won both those matches. And I, I kept saying she has no business beating Masha Slamovich. Like, just none. In, in no, no world does that freaking make any sense. I don't care who's a heel, baby face. I don't care what the storyline is. I don't care if she cheats. Like, she has absolutely no business beating Masha Slamovich. Then we got a title matches. So title matches that we've seen on TV. The Knockouts Championship. Uh, we got nine times, which... N- no surprise there because Jordan Grace wrestles open challenges and wrestles just whoever because there's been no storylines for her. She just defends the title. So, yeah, um, not a big shocker. Nine times. Six times is actually the digital media championship. I'm here to tell you right now. We don't care. Let me tell, right, let me tell you. <laughs> we don't care. I don't recall that being on the line six times this year on TV. That's crazy. The PCO hasn't even fucking defended that thing. So, yeah, I guess so. Uh, tag team titles have defended three times on TV. The TNA World title twice. Uh, the X Division Championship twice. Dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge. And the Knockouts Tag Team Championships once. So, that, that's fine. I think the Knockouts Tag Team titles are more of a pre-show title. I think that's just uh, a better fit. Um, the Digital Media Championship, to me, that's a pre-show title, too. I mean, what... What the fuck is the point of calling it the Digital Media Championship if you're just defending it on television? But it is also one of the worst titles in history of pro wrestling. Next is televis- excuse me, televised title defenses from the current champions in their current reign. Uh, so Jordan Grace has defended 18 title defenses. How many re- matches has she res- wrestled this year, though? That doesn't make any sense because it says she's wrestled... 14 TV matches, but she's defended the title 18 times. So that really doesn't make any sense, but that's what statistics say. Uh, Nick Nemeth has defended four times on TV. Cheeseball Mike Bailey has uh, defended it once. PCO has defended both of his bullshit titles once. Uh, Versus who? I have absolutely no idea. I, I honest to God have no idea. And um, Spitfire has defended theirs once. That was against the NXT Job Girls. And the system zero times uh, because they just got the titles back. So they haven't defended them. But we know that they have defended them on TV. And the last one I'm going to talk about here is just because it's funny to me. um, But Zachary Wentz, 14 days as the X Division champion. So, I mean, they, they literally like, hey, dude, put this title on. And uh, go defend it, come back, and lose it. I don't want to play with you anymore. And then Tommy Dreamer, 13 days as the digital media championship. I got to play this one more time. I'm here to tell you right now. 
We don't care. Let me tell you. Right, let me tell you <laughs> we don't care. And that was shocking to me that he's had the title. He had the title for 13 days because I thought it was one of the longest title reigns in the history of TNA. Like, no shit. I was so pissed when he won the title, and I feel like he had it forever. But they're saying here that he had it less than two weeks. That's that is crazy to me. I I remember him getting the new title. Maybe they didn't count like the little. I don't know. Maybe they didn't count like the, the, the you know December the bull, bullshit. That just doesn't make any sense because they didn't really have any TV shows in December and November and. I don't know. These are just the stats, folks. These are just the stats. Um, we're going to get into this TNA mailbag now. And as I said, I just took a handful of questions here. Colby Ryan Cooper says, who do you think will be the next X Division champion? Full disclosure, I have no clue what the Bound for Glory match is. I know that the spoiler is out. And many of you probably know what the match is. I have absolutely no clue what the match is. But if I had to answer the question just based off the information that I have in front of me, you know, what I see on television, I would say Leon Slater is going to win it. I don't think he's necessarily ready. I do think he's the future of the X Division, but I don't think he's ready. But I, who, who the fuck else is going to win? You know what I'm saying? Um, I, I, think, I think he's the guy. John Charman said, uh, conspiracy theory here, but do you think WWE is just using TNA to hurt AEW? And we'll drop them like a stone once they got rid of the competition. So, um, <laughs> I actually do believe that the partnership was put together as uh, to combat what AEW is doing. Because AEW partners with a lot of promotions. Uh, the, the partnerships mean nothing. You know, they just do it like it's, they just do dream matches. The AEW guys always win. And, you know, we, we saw how they treated Impact. They treated Impact the worst by far. Don't don't get don't get that confused. But you know, I don't think like New Japan is you know they've I mean they brought a DD T Pro guys and um, you know they, they'll bring people in from AAA. Uh, what's the other one? CMLL. The CMLL guys I don't think ever won a, a match on AW. I'm I'm pretty sure they never did. If they did, it was like Ring of Honor or something like that. But they have they have done a lot of partnerships. They've been complete fucking shit. And I th- I do think AEW was like, hey, we're gonna partner with the one company that we see value in as far as the talent that they have, and uh, we're gonna do it the right way. And they have done it the right way. It's the the fans of both companies of NXT and uh, TNA have been very pleased with what they're doing. They're enjoying it. It's been a lot of fun. And they have saved the knockouts division because he keeps sending us women. So I do. Th- I don't think they're like trying to put AEW out of business by doing it, but I do think that uh, you know they they took what AEW is doing, said we can do what you do, but a lot better. You know that's that's really uh, the way that I looked at it. Do I think they're using? He didn't ask this, but do I think they're using TNA? I don't, but I do think they're probably looking to poach TNA talent because that's just what they do. Randy Adams said, do you think we're finally seeing a strong improvement for the knockouts division? Is there anyone else you would add to thin the ro- to this thin roster to help beef it up? So last mailbag, I went over like 10 names of, of women I would like to see in the division. And we're seeing some improvements because we, we got the, uh, the female Goldberg recently. And um, I, th- you know, Ky- I think Kylan King will be back about for glory at the, at the, uh, Call your shot gauntlet. Uh, I could see Savannah Evans probably coming back too. I mentioned on a couple podcasts that she's being repackaged. So, you know, even just to get them back, you know, I don't think they're going to debut any more females. If I, if I had a swing for the fences though, with, you know, Jordan Grace likely to depart, I said this uh, this time last year, you know, Mandy Rose, I would, I would do it. I would do whatever it takes to try to get her. TNA will always be a play for the women because the knockouts have such a rich history and AEW's women's division is booked horribly. And they also have a lot of women, but they're booked absolutely horribly. I mean, look at 
Taya Valkyrie and Deanna Perrazzo over there. And now they're putting together like a tag team and, you know, that, that might go some, go somewhere, but you know, for the most part, anyone who's gone over there as a female talent, it has been a complete afterthought. So I think TNA is always to be able to get going to be able to compete for the big female names, the, the males, not so much, but I would really try to go in and I don't even know if she wants to wrestle anymore, but, um, I really try to go all in on Mandy Rose. Um, but as far as like like lesser known names that I think would be a benefit that I didn't bring them up last time is uh, Hollywood Haley J. Even though she's made it pretty clear she wants to go to AEW or WWE, and she's not the world's best wrestler, but she's a she's a great television talent, and I think TNA is actually would be a perfect spot for her. So Hollywood Haley J. I think would be a good one. And selfishly, I like uh, Paola Mayfield a lot. She used to be, so I watch with my wife, I watch uh, 90 Day Fiance, and she is from that realm. She's from that uh, that family. She was uh, on that show, but then she is a pro wrestler now. And she they just signed signed her on uh, Women, Women of Wrestling, and she did some NWA dates. So she's another one that, I don't know how like television ready she is because she's still a little bit green, but I think she's also pretty good. So uh, there, there's there's women out there. Uh, John Charman asks again on a less serious note: Do you think Laredo Kid will ever get his contractually obligated rematch uh, for the Digital Media Championship? He is the number one contender, and he says I care about I care about it as much as Laredo Kid probably does. Uh, yeah. Rado Kid, number one contender for the Digital Media Championship, oh. has never got his contractually obligated rematch. You know, I, I was going through all these matches we've seen and people we've seen on TV. If you had to take terminology, I think you would have like, oh, and, and, and a kick out and contractually obligated rematch. You know, those those probably uh those probably would be up there as far as like phrases that we just see on see and hear not see but uh here on tv like non-freaking stop um what was the question though do i think he'll get the the match i don't i they're the contractually obligated rematch bullshit is like it's just an excuse it's it's a and i'm not, not even just an excuse for tna it's a it's an excuse for pro wrestling in general to be lazy and to justify matches but they know no one wants to see. They know no one wanted to see Laredo Kid versus AJ Francis the second time, and they know that no one wants to see Laredo Kid versus PCO. You know what I'm saying? Like they're just gonna play dumb. They're, he's never gonna get his rematch. But I will let you guys know every every time that he is the number one contender for the digital media championship. Um, Michael Spikes has a couple here. I want to see a new head of creative in TNA. Tommy Dreamer booking is so predictable. He's pushing his old friends like PCO and Rhino. So Tommy Dreamer is not the head of creative. They're booking by committee. And at least this is what I was told is that they're booking by committee. And that does lead to some bumping heads. And we, we see that on TV because there's there are things creatively that don't make a lot of sense on television. But they end up you know, you give it two or three weeks for them to work through it. They usually kind of get to the destination they're trying to go to. But yeah, we've seen we've seen some things on TV that make no sense. Like I gave a lot of props for the the road they created for Joe Hendry to get to Bound for Glory. If this were Scott Demore and Joe Hendry got popular, he would have given him a title match right away. There would have been no. He would just be like next week number one contenders match. He would have won, and then he'd go wrestle for the title. TNA did not blow their load on this, and they made sure that he got through the system, that he got through Frankie Kazarian, that he got through Josh Alexander. So he had a path. He had a road. You know what I'm saying? Was it a little bit predictable? Yes, but at least he wasn't just given a title shot, which is what happens a lot of the time. Now, was it good necessarily? Not really. And, and that's probably where they have the snafus and creative because Joe Hendry, um, when he was wrestling the system, it was, it felt really unnecessary because he already, 
fucking beat them and he pinned Moose at the at, at the pay-per-view, but for some reason he had to continue to feud with them rather than Frankie Kazarian, so who uh, who he should have been mad at rather than Josh Alexander, who he should have been mad at. Like it, it took like a month, month and a half for him to be like, oh yeah, I don't like you guys. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that's why I'm saying it wasn't very good. But at the same time, I see what they were doing. You know, they they built a road for him to get to point A to point B. And the final boss for him was Frankie Kazarian, who, again, they they didn't remind us of any of these things on TV. Telegraph and Tom was completely silent. But if you go back, he beat him in a match. He cheated. And then he threw him out first in the Battle Royal at NXT. And you know what I'm saying? Like, there was a little story there. It just wasn't told very well. But I see what they were trying to do. Um. I think there we are seeing creative improvements. Last year, I thought creative was awful. I thought it was like Scott. I I felt like Scott Demore was trying to mirror AEW and say, "Well, AEW doesn't do stories; they just have really good matches, and the fans are really happy with that." And then that's what he went ahead and did. And I'll say for like 2022 and 2023, it was like that. I think it was um. Let's have Josh Alexander wrestle as much as possible, wrestle long 45 minute matches, hour matches. Uh, Cheeseball Mike Bailey, let's have him wrestle as long as humanly possible. Um, you know, they had TJ, uh, TJ Francis, TJ Perkins at one point, kind of the tail end of uh, 2022 going into 23, I think, or maybe it's 21 into 22. But when he was around, they kind of, that's, they started it with him, you know. Let's just have these long matches that mean absolutely fucking nothing. And that was that was what a lot of creative was the last couple of years with Scott around. Now, was there some storylines? Yeah, but it just it just felt like yeah, but it just felt like when we were watching the show, they were trying to mirror what AEW was doing. Like that was working, you know what I'm saying? So they definitely got away from a, from being a lot more creative. But I see them going and. A good direction a positive direction is it perfect no be more of a more of an effort and then he also asked um could tna wrestling pull off a show or pay-per-view at mall of america like an outdoor pay-per-view show like a like wcw do with monday nitro i mean they can do television wherever they want and it would work but i think when you're comparing it to wcw TNA does not have the brand recognition. Like TNA is known by wrestling fans. You cannot, I, trust me, I can tell my wife and she knows our fucking podcast. I bring up TNA. She doesn't know what I'm talking about. Uh, well, if I say impact, she, she knows, but there's just not a lot of brand recognition within TNA in the, in the casual space. There was there was back in the day when they were messing with Jersey Shore and all that stuff, but they have never reached the the popular popularity levels of a WCW. You can still mention WCW to to casual fans now. I say casual fans. That's probably not a good. So people might have watched wrestling in the Attitude Era and then don't care anymore. Like you could bring up a WCW and they'll a few a few people might think you mean Women Crush Wednesday or Women Crush Wednesday, whatever it's called. But they know what you're talking about. So my point in saying that, if they want to film television outdoors or whatever, they can pull it off. You're just going to get wrestling fans, though. You know, if you're saying, hey, we're going to go do Mall of America, TNA is going to be there. You're not going to get some outsiders from the street. Let's go watch TNA. They don't know what it is. To them, it's just indie wrestling, if they even know what indie wrestling is. So, yeah, I mean, they can pull it off. They've done the stadium shows before. It's possible, they, but you just, you know, you're just gonna get wrestling fans. When they've done some of these pay per views, they'll go to minor league baseball games and they'll, you know, they'll do some promotion and and a lot of TNAs are fan, a lot of the TNA fans are always like, well, where's the where's the fans from the baseball game? Like, no one, no one that does. That, if you watch wrestling, that's the only that's the only people that's gonna show up at these TNA shows. I don't care who you fucking promote to if it's it's non-wrestling fans they are not going to show up to a random tna show i freaking promise you you might get one or two here or there but it just doesn't really work like that 
Uh, that will do it for me, folks. So hopefully we'll be back in the saddle next week. I just I have no clue if there's going to be an episode or not. I know they announced matches last week, but the TV recording schedule obviously got changed. So we don't know where they're going to go with that. Uh, I, I don't imagine they're – I'm sure, you know, they have a contingency plan. So I'm pretty sure they're going to get back on the ball next week. Um, so hopefully it's just, just one break here because we got Bound for Glory coming up. They got a lot of creative that they're going to have to because they're missed. They're going to be an episode short now, so they have a lot of creative that they're going to have to push very quickly. And every year, Bound for Glory's build is always very suspect, and it's always very last minute. It's always okay. Bound for Glory's in a week. We have three matches announced, and then they'll just throw a bunch of shit at you. And it's going to be even worse this time around. But that's going to do it for me, folks. I'm your boy BQ. We'll talk soon. Peace.